So I'll make sure to let people know that. I'm also going to invite <clears throat> to this meeting uh, one other thing. My It's called Otter Pilot. You, you've probably seen it before, but it's kind of a, a live transcriber as well. Helpful for capturing action items and things like that. Awesome. Jillian Singletary, she sounds trustworthy. Uh -huh. Perfect. I got it now. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. We'll get started in just about one minute, right on time. Not now, dear. That's not a good time, dear. No, I don't think we did, dear. <laughs> All right. Nice. Okay, cool. Uh, 1130. So yeah, welcome everybody. I know we always have several who join very, very close to uh, to time and sometimes it's you know coming off of something else right after lunch. But uh, welcome to the October meeting of the Power VI, Oklahoma Power VI user group right here in the central United States. Uh, one of the benefits of our virtual meetings is we can have people join us from all over. And today we're very excited to have Steve Campbell um, not from Oklahoma, but from uh, Great Britain, uh, actually the United Kingdom, uh, joining us today. And so he can uh, he'll he'll give a lot a uh, little bit more information about his background and some of the things that he's doing. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about version control. Uh, there's been a lot of movement on that in Power BI this year, and I, I know I think a couple of months ago we went through a presentation to kind of walk through at a high level here are some options do you want to learn git or not i think steve's presentation is a perfect follow-up to that because it is very practical and he'll be demonstrating some things for us uh live and it'll be a great chance for you to ask questions as well because this is something that steve writes about and has been working on uh quite quite a while oftentimes we'll all start with some of the key releases for power bi and uh, I did want to cover that very quickly and um, also mention our, we're just going to plan for one more meeting for this year. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But um, one of the bigger things that I saw in the last month was it, we, you can have more stages and deployment pipelines now. So if that is something that it, you use deployment pipelines, um, that could be very useful for you. Instead of just being limited to just kind of two or three, you can get up to 10 now. So. If you have lots of, if you're a bigger organization, you have lots of stages. So some people have a pre-prod or they'll call it a golden or just different things like that. It gives you a whole lot more options on how many environments you really want to have. Uh, Power, Power BI keeps making improvements in their on object formatting. And so like you'll see a little more as you work in Power BI desktop, as you get onto the later versions, contextual pop-ups that are popping up uh, where you can actually, like for example, um, I'll share my screen here. i uh, just pull it up, just an example from the blog site here that um, you'll see these data labels uh, in like in context. So very nice in that, you know, and rather than in the past of having to be a guru about going to what I used to call the paint roller is now a paintbrush. And, you know, it's great that you can go over there and you can search for all the properties and that's awesome. But if you just want to add data labels, especially for those of us who grew up and the first charts we made were in Excel, this is actually a little more intuitive to be like, I just right click on the thing I want to change and make the change I want to. So very, very helpful to see things like that. But um, the other the other change that I have noticed and I couldn't find a screenshot of it because I only saw it on somebody else's screen, but um, I haven't got it to, to take effect on mine yet, but they're kind of changing up how the panels collapse in, in the Power BI desktop designer. Has anybody else seen that where it doesn't so much look like these 
um, fold out blades anymore that stack on top of each other, but there's like one thing on the right hand side with with several icons. Uh, is anybody working in that experience right now? Okay, I, I thought it was strange because I was like, I have not seen this yet, but I, I distinctly saw it on someone's uh, desktop. So I'm going to try to find a screenshot of that. I think we got the chat in there, maybe. Let me uh, make sure I can see the chat window here. Yeah, OK, yeah, uh, Juan, I see your question and let me come back to that and I'll make sure to address that before we get started. So yeah, and then the last big thing and we we've touched on these before, but not um, dive deep into them because before they were a lot more of a they were a little bit more of an advanced concept because they existed only in external tools. But Power BI is just like we thought they might starting to bring the idea of calculation groups into Power BI desktop itself. So they as part of a preview, they have created this experience where you can <laughs> yes, applause. They are a really helpful feature and the biggest impact that you can see them make is when you have models that have a lot of measures like they can tend to take big swaths of measures and you can let's say if you have six to do one thing and six to do another and six to do another you can tend to make that into just six measures in a calculation group that has three items so you're dealing more with uh you know much more intuitive and it also makes for some really cool scenarios like where for example we were doing a report uh, this month that they were saying, well, we'd love to see that total, but we'd love to see the number pre-tax, and then we'd love to see the number post-tax. And so um, I, I actually think we were able to achieve that with a field parameter, but at first we certainly could have done it with a calculation group as well, to be like, there's just calculate these same numbers, but with this one filter changed for all six of them. So really helpful. And my thought is we, in November, we're going to talk about, uh, I'll just go ahead and talk about November's meeting. We're going to talk about PBI tools and have an organization who's used PBI tools to do a lot of their, to automate a lot of Power BI stuff. Um, and so that'll be November 16th. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe we'll come back to calculation groups in January or just for sure as soon as it is uh, generally available on that. So. Uh, Juan had a question in the chat about where will the recording be hosted and Juan it is uh, it's always my intention to get these things up on YouTube as this comes out of my mouth I'm looking back and thinking I don't think I put September's up on YouTube so need to process two videos but uh, we have a YouTube channel I'll pull up here and put it in the chat so everybody can find it um, and that's where we will uh, put up Put up the videos from past meetings and uh, try to make sure they're always here so hopefully that will answer your question uh, as far as a uh, transcript um i don't know where i'll host that yeah there august is the last one so i didn't have a beer in august that's weird okay um <laughs> all right cool any other questions before we start kind of on our main presentation and get into the meat and potatoes That, that was an English food joke, by the way, Steve. Um, so yeah, so Steve has, has done something very cool this year. He has kind of launched his own uh, consulting firm. It's called Sunny BI, S-U-N-N-Y. It's a great name. And so he's specializing in data modernization, uh, consulting services, and um, he really has a great emphasis on training and on deployment in Power BI. So he's a definitely a very skilled trainer. I've seen him train on Power BI and Excel. He blogs a lot. You can find a lot of his content on powerbi.tips, a site that we referenced here uh, many times. Very helpful site that has the theme generation tools and also is the home of a, a, a podcast called Explicit Measures. If you want to hear uh, even more in-depth kind of conversations about Power BI, the Explicit Measures podcast is a lot of fun to check out with Mike Carlo and uh, Tommy, I was like, kicking up his last name without his Mike, first Tommy name. and Seth. Yeah, yeah. Seth, that's Seth Bauer. Thank you, absolutely. Um, and then also, uh, Steve runs the Brew City Power Platform User Group as well. He co he co-hosts it like I do with Jeremy and Taguma. So yeah, with that, please help me welcome on Steve. And Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah, excited to be here. 
and to talk about something really, really cool. So with that, I'm just going to share my screen. You should see my slide. Let me know if it's coming through, okay? Yes. Yep, good. Okay, excellent. Um, I won't spend too much because uh, just been introduced, but thank you very much. So as I as we're saying, I do a lot of training and consulting. Um, Sunny BI is my new company, launched actually just a couple of months ago. It's a lot of Power BI governance, large deployments, and that's really where this presentation comes from. So here's my website down the bottom, Sunny BI Training. It is on every slide. So if you forget it, <laughs> don't worry. Um, you will certainly see it. The reason I put it here is that um, I'll, I'll explain the layout, but all the concepts I go through are available there as well. And I'll show you at the end. So a lot of what I'm talking about, you'll be able to see. I'm, I'm going to go through loads of terminology. You can go and, and see the specific bits in case you miss it. OK, so Git and Power BI developer mode. To give this a little context, um, as, as said in the meeting invite and the description, we're going to take this from the beginning. There's no assumption of knowing what either of these are. We're going to explain Git very um, without any code, without any jargon, try and get the main concepts. We're not going to go deep into it and we're not going to look um, through lots of code, all of this kind of stuff. Something when I was learning Git and first exposed to it, people love to open command line and start writing lots of complex. None of that. We'll go through lots of slides and visually and just try and understand really what's happening behind the scenes of Git. We'll also have a look at the Power BI developer mode, which is the new mode. It's still very new and in preview. But it's coming, and I think over the next months, maybe six months to a year, especially, you'll see lots of this, lots of organizations start taking this up. So I think it's really important for us to get ahead of this now to really understand what it is and just see the awesome power actually of what it can do. So, Git, I'm going to go through, and a lot of this, the first half especially, or the first probably 60%, is going to be talking through different terminologies, explaining what things are, as I say, at a very high level, so that we can try and understand the theory behind and what actually Git is doing under the covers. Then we'll have a look at a little example with Power BI and look how it works in Power BI development mode. So Git. Typically, when we have files, um, especially when we're working in Excel, you might do something like this. We'll save a budget. However, often we want to go and we know we're making changes. We're not sure if the changes are correct. So often people version control like this, right? And they just start adding numbers and, and letters and their initials. This is a, a type of version control, right? And we have different versions of the file. We can go back in time and to check that we've seen things. However, as you can see, often the name convention, I'm sure you've all seen this before, especially if anyone works in or near to a finance team, uh, very, very common. It gets very out of hand very quick. To make matters worse, um, typically we're not the only employee at our company. So while we might be doing this, there's a whole bunch of people who are going around and trying to work on these files when you have this, it's very difficult to know which is the latest file that we're working on. You know, people are pinging emails and, and we get lost very quickly. So what can we do? Well, the simplest way of version control is we can say, why don't we have a central location? And then we can all work off this central location. And this is very common. Uh, something, and I'll, I'll send some links at the end, but I actually have a tool which can help us out called Power BI version control. And SharePoint is a great um, example of this. Typically, we save something in a central location, such as SharePoint. We can all work off the same version. You know, uh, Excel Online or all these now Power BI is going online. Very easy, right, to work off, off a central location. However, with this, this does cause um, some challenges. It's hard when you're all trying to do things at the same time. So what Git is, 
is Git is what we call a distributed version control. And essentially, we all have our own copy. Now, I'm going to talk about code from now on, and I'm going to call this code. So Git is version control for code. When I say code, any sort of code files um, it works well with. So anything, you know, any text files which contain code. It does work on other stuff, but primarily, you know, you're aimed at, at using code. So code files, and that's indicated here by these little documents. And we're going to go through and see how this relates into Power BI and the new developer mode. So obviously, though, we still need some sort of central location because um, we all want to have our copies. So really, Git is, is kind of follows this. We all have a copy of the code. And there's a central location where we can all, all have the main version, but we can all take bits, work on things individually. This opens, as we'll see, a lot of cool functionality. And Git really is the is the, the process and the tool that manages how all this works and how we work together. Um, OK, so the Git basics. I'm going to go into now explaining a bit of what Git is, and we're just going to talk through a few key terminology. A lot of this is going to be talking about terminology. It's going to allow us just to understand Git at a, at a basic level. And you, a lot of when you start talking about Git, you will hear these words a lot. So understanding the first thing we're going to go through is what commits, merge, and repos are. So let's imagine, as I said, we all have our distributed um, version control, so we all have a copy. Now we're going to start looking at a specific instance of, of what Git does. So we can see here in the top left my screen, we have a centralized location, and we're going to focus on, on this developer. And this is indicated, right, that he's working on his local machine. And you can see here he has a file with some code. So let's look at what happens on his local machine. So our developer has some code. This is actually a part of Power BI code. So this is the, the underlying code, which we'll actually see at the end. Um, and this, as, as you can imagine, this describes some columns. So he's got a, two columns in this, in this bit of code. Obviously, there's a lot more normally, but to make it easy, we're just going to look at these two columns. So developer, he's working on this code. He's writing the code um, on his local machine. So what is Git? Git is a way of managing version control. So essentially, when I, when I say I'm going to use Git, what that means is I'm going to start a little database on my machine. And inside this database is lots of different saved versions. So I might have this code in the gray, and I'm going to save this into my database. So my Git database down the bottom here. And then what happens is I will make a change. So I might add another column or add some lines of code. Then I will also save this into my Git, into my Git database. So now I've saved my initial version. I've made a change. I've saved it again. Then I might delete this column and I'll resave this. Now, what Git does is rather than overwrite, we actually keep a copy of everything we've done. And that is essentially the, the main aspect of version control, of course, right? Because it's version we want to be able to go back. So this enables us, for example, to say, hey, Git, I didn't actually mean to delete that column. I realized I wanted that column. So I can kind of go back in time and I can reload the version two. Very simply, this is this is what version control is. And when we talk about Git, we have our code that we're working on. We make little um, saves into our Git database, and that means we can go back in time and we can load versions. So it's very safe editing what we're doing. And this is what uh, what we mean when we say commit. So in Git language, you will hear people talking about commits. Very simply, at a, at a high level. This is when we regularly save the version of our code, and this is called a commit. So we want to commit our code. This means we make saves regularly as, as we're changing so that we have all these different versions and can always go back in time and see different versions of the code. So this is us obviously working on our local machine. However, of course, this is us on our local machine. We're going to have others, and the whole point is we get 
there's other people working on their local machines as well. So this is why it's called distributed. We all have copies on our local machine that we're working on independently. Now, of course, we want to have a main copy of our code where we've made our changes and we can we can put them back into the main copy. So there is a main copy of the code and that's hosted in the cloud. Right? We need somewhere in the cloud to host this that we can all access. We do things and a big part of Git, which probably isn't too, too relevant anymore, is that you can work offline and you don't need internet access. Probably we always have internet access wherever we go, but uh, a big thing of Git being distributed, we can all work on our local machines. We make these commits and save them. Of course, at some point, we need to have this main copy of our code. So this main copy, and this is what we call a repository, but really, um, you'll always hear it as a repo. So when people say the repo, right, that what they mean is, is where is this main copy of code hosted online somewhere in some platform? And we'll go through a couple of those platforms. So this is a central location where the code that we're kept and then we're working on these little copies and we're saving them to our Git database. At some point, I'm happy with all the changes I've made. So I want to add my changes back to the, the repo. So I want to put my changes back into the main copy of the code. Now, the good thing when you're working with code is you can think of code in lines. So we have a, a text file and, and we'll see some examples of this. But I know I've only worked on a small bit. So when you think of a Power BI file, I might only be editing some measures or maybe someone else is editing some columns. Now, these are different parts of the code that we're working on. So instead of us saying, I want to put my version back to the main, I don't just replace the, the, the main version in the repo. I only put back the changes that I made, and we'll, we'll look at some examples of this later. And this is called merging. So when I've finished, maybe I've, I've changed a few lines of code, instead of uploading the whole file and then replacing you know, the, the main copy, what I'll do is it Git will see the bits that I've changed and then change that in the main copy. So it's called merging because it's not a replace. We're just merging the bits I've changed into the main version. What this means, and we'll see how, this means that if I changed you know, the measures part of the code and somebody else changed the columns part of the code, we can both merge those bits without having any conflicts because we've changed different parts of the code. And that is how Git is so powerful and allows multiple people to work on things at the same time. So now we're going to talk into a very important concept called branching. So what we normally have in our repo is, as well as having a copy of the code, and we'll see how this works, we have our, our what we call branches. So we always have this main, normally they call it main, a uh, very common uh, naming convention. And this is going to be, you know, a golden standard of code. This is, for example, in Power BI, this could be the, the one that the end users are seeing, the main copy. However, we might say, you know, we want to add a new page to our report. So we're going to call this a feature because we're adding a feature, right? This is a new page, this is a feature. So Another thing of Git, and you'll see we're essentially working copies of copies of copies. Instead of us all working on this main, the single, the single main version that, that the end user is seeing, what we do is we call, we say we make this a branch. And you can think of each of these circles as, as a copy of the code. So what we might do is we say, I want to make a, a new page, a new feature, and this feature is going to be a new page. So what I'll do is I'll create a branch. Branches you can think of a bit like folders. I copy the main copy into a new folder, into a new branch. We say we're all going to work off this, this copy. That way, if we really mess up, um, we can just delete this and say, let's start again. So it's really good at securing not working off the main copy. We want to keep that and we want to go away. We want to do um, our changes on a copy. We want to test it out first until we're happy with it then we can merge that back to the main one. So again, copies of copies of copies, and we'll see how far this goes out. So we've said, I've made a copy of the code over here called the feature branch, and they call it a branch. 
imagine it like a, a new folder where I've just copied the main code and they say we're going to we're going to work on this and this is the one we're going to add the page to. However, whilst this is happening, we might notice that there's actually an error somewhere else. So one of our measures we've realized is actually wrong. Um, and this is really key because this is going out to our, our C-suite and we say we need to fix this error straight away. So instead of the, the people stopping working on their feature, adding that page, what we can do is we can create another branch. And we say this is called a hotfix. And we might have the same developers or some different developers. They, they're tasked with fixing this, this error because we've noticed this is an error. We need to fix this as soon as possible. It was a mistake. No one called it before. So what they do, again, is they make a copy of, of the code, a different um, from the main copy. So we're ignoring what people are doing in this, this feature branch over here, adding their page. They're doing this in isolation. So we take the main copy. We say, let's fix this error. So this team goes and fixes this error. Once they fixed it, they say, OK, we're good. We're happy that we fixed this error. And you can see that they're going to merge their code back into the main branch. So what that means is now, up until this point, we've just taken copies of the main code. We've actually changed something now. We fixed the error and we say we're going to put this error. We're going to merge it back. We're going to uh, apply our changes that we did in this hotfix branch back to the main copy. So this main copy now, um, what the, the change we've made is, is the fix to the error of the, the measure. Meanwhile, in outside of this, the, the people are working, the other developers, they're working on adding this page. You'll notice that now these versions are going to be slightly different because this version contains the error fix, where this version does not contain the error fix. And that's fine because, again, when we're saying we, we're merging, we're not just replacing the file. So what we can do is maybe the, the feature we've added this new page in, and they want to say we're done with a page and we can merge this back to the main. Now this works because the people who are doing the feature branch, they haven't changed the definition of the of the, the wrong measure, right? So the hot fix branch, there was an error, they they rewrote the measure and they fixed it. The feature branch, they may use that measure, but they didn't change the definition. So there's no conflict. They both changed different parts of the code. They've both done different things. Because of this, we can say that's fine. You'll see this. Even though this was a different version because they've applied a fix here. They've applied this fix, right? And this version it doesn't have the fix. We're going to merge these two versions together. And that's really what a merge is. We apply the changes from this one and the changes from this one. And then we get both changes back into the main branch. Obviously. If the two teams did work on the same thing, so say they both changed the measure, then you would have something called a conflict and would have to say, hey, look, you both changed the same measure. Which one of this are we going to? And we have to just manually review that because we can't automatically pick it. So if as long as we work on separate things, and this is where Git also works a lot, that you need some sort of management and it's a good process around it. So we're making sure we're not all working on the same thing. As long as these people over here on the feature branch, they're adding a page, they're adding visuals. These people on the hotfix branch, they're fixing a, a broken measure. We're not changing the same code, so we're happy. And even though our versions are different, once we merge them back, they all get merged together and we get the changes from both. So let's have a little example. And to do this, we're going to actually use um, this example of code here. One thing with code and how this works is when you have code, um, it has line numbers typically. And even in DAX, right? Even now, DAX has line numbers. This is a very simple thing. And we're just going to say, imagine this is code and it has three lines, and each line it only has one word each. So, hello world, bye. This is our code. What we've said, we've said we want to make some changes to the code um, and we're going to make a branch. The first thing we do is we'll make this feature branch and say, hey, we want to update this code. So the main version is copied over to the branch. 
that way, right, we can work in isolation and we're not working on the main one, risking messing up what end users are seeing. This is called checkout. So if you hear someone saying checkout, this is really what they mean. You know, checking out the code, making this new branch. So then we have this branch and this is still in the cloud. Um, it's just a copy at this moment of, of our main version of code. What we said, obviously, um, Git is distributed. So the, the main version that we have a copy of, we call this in a remote because that's in the central location, this branch, that's um, in the cloud. Then I take a copy onto my local machine. So really what I'm working on at this point is a copy of the main one into the branch and then a copy of that branch into my local machine. And although it seems quite diluted, this really stops us from being able to mess things up because all of these steps, every time we want to merge, as we'll see, there's steps around reviewing, um, checking. So it's really about, and you can imagine if you have really big teams, if you only had one version and everyone's working up the same version, get really complex. So I have my copy and we call this local because it's on local. When I say local, I just mean on, on my computer, right? It could be on my desktop. Or, um, and then we have the branch, which is still in the remote. And it's just that this branch, again, is the copy of the main code, but it's called a branch because we're working on a specific task. Now, within um, my local, I'm not going to go into this too much. I just want to show this because you'll see this terminology probably. You really have three stages. Um, and this is in that Git database. So you have something called a working directory, a staging, and then the local repository. I'm just going to kind of split glaze over this because I will come back to it. But this is the inner workings when I say Git is, you know, on my local machine. These are the three elements of it. I'll come back to this because we'll sh actually show it in an example. So I have my copy. Now what I want to do is I'm going to start making my changes. So to my copy, what I'm going to do is, is I've been given my task. Now I'm going to update line two. So instead of it saying now, hello world by, it's going to say hello planet by. Right, and this is on my copy on my local machine. So I'm going to save this, I'm going to commit it into my Git, into my little database on my local machine. And now I've made changes to my copy. However, typically with Git, right, we've said this is distributed. So there's multiple people working on the code at the same time. Now, me and Dave, we're both working on the same piece of code from the same branch. We both made a copy onto our local machine. Now, Dave is also making changes. However, we have good communication. We know that we're not changing the same lines. So he's changed the first line called hey. So now his code says hey world by, and my code says hello planet by. Now, obviously, because we're both working on our local machine, the main copy in the repo in the branch in the middle here, that doesn't know the, the changes we've made because they're done on our local machines. So we need to be able to update this. So Dave says, OK, I'm happy with mine. He says, I want to now make my changes uh, back to the branch so that other people can see them. So he says, I want to uh, add my changes back to the branch. And this is called a push. And that's quite simple if you think about it. Dave is pushing his changes into the, into the branch, into the repo. So Dave's changes now get updated into the branch because he's happy with it. And he pushes his changes. Now, me over on the right, my copy. What I want to do is I want to see the changes that anyone else has made. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something called a pull action. And so I had in this step here, I had the changes I've made. Dave's uh, already done his changes and he's pushed them back to the repo. So I say, I'm going to pull. So I'm going to see any changes anyone else has made and put it into my version. And you can see here's the magic. Because Dave changed this line and I changed this line, and this is what we mean by merging. So if I pull his changes, I can easily pull his change and keep my change. And then the rest is, is the same for both of us. 
So I've merged the two changes because I put his changes into my copy. Again, if we had both changed line two, it would come up with an error and say you've both changed the same thing and there's a conflict and it, you have to do this manually and you have to talk to Dave and we say, OK, you know, which is the correct version? The idea, though, is that we shouldn't both be working on the same thing. And a lot of this comes around process and it, it's all helped with, um, you know, the, the tools available. So and knowing that we've done this correctly and, and he, he was tasked to change line one, I was tasked to change line two. I can pull this in and it merges it. Then I'm happy. I read the whole thing and I say, yes, uh, you know, this makes sense. Hey, planet by that was our objective to change it to. So, you know, I can push my changes back in. Again, if there's any questions, obviously feel free to, to write in the chat and monitoring you too, but that's the idea here. So the branch is in the repo in, in the cloud version. Me and Dave both have a copy of the branch. We're both working on different things. We need to push and pull our changes. So we need to push our changes back up and it's called sync if you do both at the same time, which you normally would. So I add my changes back and I see the changes everyone else has done. We do this regularly. Um, and that means we're always in sync and that way we can all work individually or work on different things while being able to sync with each other. Again, so you push your changes back or you can pull other changes into your version. So we have our, our branch and again, this is now even though me and Dave, we've, we've synced and said this branch is ready. We were both working again locally. So this was on our own machines. Uh, we pushed it into the remote, the branch. Now this is obviously the branch is a copy of the main because maybe we said, oh, we've missed this. We can delete this branch, whatever. Again, there's another level of checks and another level of security to not mess things up. But say, hey, we're happy with the branch. We've made the changes. What we do is we add our changes back to them to the main. So this is similar to that push, right? Except this is from the branch into the main version. So merging those back and now that main version, which is the version that people are seeing, this is the golden standard, right? The one that the end users see. This now has our changes. You can see here how many steps there are to, to really um, to, to reduce errors happening. And even an extra step is something called a pull request. So instead of us just saying me and Dave said, yeah, this is correct, let's push it back. Actually, what you can do is you raise a pull request. Um, pull request basically means me and Dave are happy with a branch. We want it to be merged back into the main copy. However, there should be another review process here. So a pull request typically is a review process where we say other people who weren't me or Dave should have a look and check the code. And now this is an extra step to make sure, right? This is all about making sure we stop errors early and that's what really powerful of git so this pull request typically says me and dave would add comments so a big thing of git is every commit every action you do you can put a comment to it you can say what you did so we add our comments they read our comments they look at the code and see what's changed and if they're happy you know and you can set this up it's up to you how the what the process is but someone else will typically say i'm happy i approve and then we can merge it in. So again, uh, merge when you're putting one branch or another, right, will be submitted to reviewed and put comments. And that's what a pull request is. OK, <laughs> so that was basics of Git. Um, I want to talk quickly about CICD as well, because it does um, does interline a lot of what we're talking about. I'm going to go fairly quick over this section and then go into an example of uh, it and actually show it in, in real life. So, we have our, our pull request here. What we can do as well on top of the pull request, so we've made our changes in our branch and we're pushing them back in, we have a pull request. Another thing we can do is um, on top of the pull request, on top of us manually looking and seeing, um, have other people manually look and review the changes, we can run something called a build pipeline. Now a build pipeline is a bunch of automated tests. 
the the biggest use case for Power BI is, um, and Daniel has a good article on this. We'll get the link for you, but you can run tabular editors, uh, best practice analyzer. And so before you allow the branch to be merged, we can automatically run the best practice analyzer. And if it sees that we've um, failed anything, so if you're not familiar, best practice analyzer automatically reads the code and checks for errors, like syntax errors or, or you know, it has loads of rules. So you can set up a bunch of rules to automatically say, hey, you, you've done something correct, this will fail. Then you can have your pull request. So it's kind of a double, there's an automated test, then a manual review. And so a great example, we could say, we, if there was a report and it had over 20 visuals, um, we, could, we could look at the code, right? And we could write an automated test to count the number of visuals on a page because the code will tell us. And we could say, nope, it will automatically fail and say, you can't do this. You've got way too many visuals on this page. Then we'll go and do that. If, if not, um, if we've got less than 20, we might then do the, the pull request. So another way of ensuring quality and stopping errors. And that is a build pipeline. CICD. So CICD is an acronym or stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment. So the continuous integration part is the automating of integration of code, multiple contributors into the single software. So it's really that managing of, of Git and it's really automating of Git, things like the build pipeline, everything we've talked about, that's really this integration piece. The other end though, is continuous deployment. On top of us doing the code, we've made the changes to the code, all of this, there has to be some sort of testing because we, we do the build pipelines, they test the code itself, but we also wanna test the numbers. We wanna have people actually test the reports to make sure that they look good and the numbers are correct. Because I can have correct code, it doesn't mean my business logic's right, or I've understood what the measure should do, right? An average of sales is fine from a code standpoint, but we might actually want the sum of sales. So having um, a testing process to make sure and the other side of it is, is correct as well. And what we've actually done is right. So this is the deployment stage. And we'll go through quite quick. So environments then. So after we've done our reviews, we wanna make sure that any changes are correct, as I say, this testing. And we wanna do this before the end user sees the report. So the easiest way to think of this in Power BI, if I mentioned this at the beginning with deployment pipelines, is, is having different workspaces. So typically you have at least three. So we have the first, which is the dev workspace. This is where we do what I get. So everything we've talked about always happens on our dev workspace. This is the developer workspace. This is where we do Git, all our different users do the Git. You know, they make their changes locally, they commit them, they merge them, we do all the branching, we merge it back in, we do our build pipelines. Then once we're happy, the build pipeline, we have something called the deployment pipeline. And this is where we have deployment pipelines in a service. What this essentially does really is it copies our assets from our workspace where we've tested, um, where we've done our build pipelines and we've done our Git. And it says, I'm gonna move these from this section into the test workspace. And this is a workspace where maybe we have some automated tests, maybe people go and look at our reports, they test the numbers, right? They test the DAXs is actually right. And they have it, all of this testing. If they're happy, you might have an automated process and we say, OK, run the deployment pipeline. It copies your assets from the test into the pod, which is production. This is maybe where we have an app set up and the end users can actually see the reports. So again, more stages to catch errors before we release it, before it goes out to the end user. And deployment pipeline, I think kind of went through this. Um, moves Basically, it just moves code right, or moves reports, moves the data sets from one environment to the other. Power BI, this is just workspaces. Power BI has deployment pipelines. Um, as we said just now, if, if you were at the beginning, this has just had some improvement this month, which is awesome. Um, and these are really that, they just move code from one um, environment to the other with some cool stuff and, and tests you can do on top. 
Things like Azure DevOps, and we'll go through what this is, also have it too. So it's not, you know, Power BI. Lots of these tools have the same thing and they call it the release pipeline. So this is another terminology you'll, you'll, you'll hear, release pipelines. Um, basically, you know, we're releasing it to, to production, releasing it to the end users. One thing is really cool is um, something got a diff compound. We'll see this in in practice. I'm not going to go into this because I'll show this, but whenever we're comparing code, a really cool thing about Git and uh, CICD is you can do this called diff compare. And essentially what it would do is it will get your version of the code that you've changed, and then it will show you the version that you're trying to merge your changes into. So this could be the one in the in the branch, or it could be between two different branches, it could be between two environments, any two versions of code. What it will do is, so this is the one, for example, I, I think this is back to front <laughs> personally, but the one on the left is the one which is um, the one that you're going to merge into. So the one that's that's where it is, and the one on the right is your version. You can see here, for example, the red it highlights very quickly things that you've changed. And the red means I've deleted something, and the green means I've added something. So in this example, I deleted this column, I think. And then I also deleted a measure called old price calculation calc. And I added a new measure called new price calc. Right. So you can quickly compare and see things, um, how you've made changes. So <coughs> that is a whirlwind tour of Git and, and some CICD. GitHub and Azure DevOps, if you're not familiar with these two, um, these are actually services. So Git is the distributed version control system for, for tracking changes, right? So Git is the, the process, the system. It's an open source project, which is why so many people use it. It's not really owned by anyone. It's just the process itself. GitHub is a web-based platform. So it's a service offered. Um, it's good for hosting Git repositories, right? So for hosting the code, for managing this. Um, and it's a it's a service owned by Microsoft. They they bought it. So GitHub is just a website. It's a service owned. Um, it's like, you know, PowerBI.com or Fabric.com. It's a product. Azure DevOps is the same thing. Um, Azure DevOps does a bit more than just Git. It also does like project management and stuff. Really, I love DevOps myself. Um, but it was also does managing Git. This is also a service owned by Microsoft. There's a ton of others out there. I just put these two because we're we're talking about Microsoft. Um, this is a Power BI user group. A lot of others. Most people probably use this. I think these are by two the the highest used. But a bunch more um, services. But Git is is the, the the project itself. The what the process is. These are products. So. With that, I'm going to take a glass of water because I know I went through that very quick. If you forget this, don't worry. Um, go back to my website, Sunny BI Training. I've broken all of this down and you can click and quickly see and um, remind yourself of, of any of these. So I know I've gone through very quick. Don't worry, they're all, all recorded out there available. So Power BI Developer Mode. This is a new mode um, and it's in preview at the moment. I call it a mode. It's a new way of saving files. It's in preview features and you can turn it on. And what it does is it allows us to do Git. We've talked about code right? and we said you need code to do Git because that's how it works, right? That's how you merge things together. You need lines of code and you need to have those code numbers so we know which bits have changed. So previously when we have, let's look at our local machine. We open a Power BI desktop file, right? A PBIX. And I'll give you a quick example of this as well. The new thing called developer mode you, is called a Power BI project. What developer mode is, it's a name for a way we can save Power BI called a Power BI project. And instead of having a PBIX file, it basically saves um, into a folder and it splits your PBIX file into the code itself. And we'll have a look at this. So it splits out your PBIX into a bunch of different code files. What this means is that now I can do Git because I have code, right? That no longer have this one PBIX where only one person can edit at the same time. 
So in order to actually do get, I can open these code files in anything. Um, I'm going to talk about Visual Studio Code. It doesn't have to be Visual Studio Code. Um, it, Visual Studio Code is a free tool by Microsoft. I'll show you an example. It's a text editor, but it also supports Git, which is really, really cool. So I can read my files, my text files. I could use Notepad, but Notepad, I can't do Git. So I do it in Visual Studio Code. I can read my, my text files and I can actually see the code behind my reports. What I can do then is using this Visual Studio Code, this is why we use this tool, I can sync this. Um, at the moment, you have to use Azure DevOps. I assume GitHub or other tools will be coming soon. But I can sync this up to the repo in Azure DevOps. So um, just, just like we saw, right, this is my local machine. By using code, I, I have this little Git on my machine. It's basically a database which saves copies. I can then push and pull this into the repo. This repo up here, this has a DevOps, that's where I do my branches and all my merging, all of this. Um, and then me and then all, and Dave and all my other developers, we all have a, a copy on our local machine. What is really cool about this is that if you have Fabric, um, well, firstly, you can do all this diff compare in Visual Studio Code. I'll go through a quick example of this, so I'm not going to spend time, but it's really cool um, with the things so you can see what you've changed. That's a really good function, actually because I can see the bits I've changed before publishing my report. So I can then push my, my changes. Um, and what Azure DevOps, the reason why I said we have to use Azure DevOps, is you can sync this to a Fabric workspace. And then instantly everything that you change shows up in your Fabric workspace. So you actually don't need to press that Publish button anymore, which is quite a big deal, um, because we can do everything actually through these text files. So. With that, I'm going to show a quick example. Feel free um, to, to have any comments if you want or questions. If not, I'll keep going. I am doing a demo now, yes. <laughs> Into the demo. So I've opened a Power BI file. This is just the sales and data file um, that, I've, that I've downloaded from the Microsoft website. On top of that, I have a folder here. Right now it's empty, and I've called it Git Demo. So I have an empty folder called Git Demo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go File, and just to show you, I've options and settings, I've got my options, and what I did before, because I'm prepared, is I've tipped Power BI project. So this is preview feature right now. Just remember that. <laughs> so preview feature, but it's, this is called developer mode. But they call it here Power BI project. Just Power BI project and developer mode are the same thing. We go file, save as. And I'm actually, I'm just going to copy this uh, link. So I'm going to save it into this folder. I don't like this new save function. So I'm going to save it into this folder. Instead of just saving it though as a PBIX, now that I've got. Um, that mode enabled the preview feature. I have this new, new way of saving things. So I'm going to save it as a PBIP file instead of a PBIX file. And this is the development mode. Now, this is what my folder, so this was the same empty folder. This actually has a bunch of things in it. And you can see that it's actually automatically splits your data set and report out, which is really, it does this in the service, right? Even though I've got a data set and report in the same file, um, it spits this out. It's got a few in this, it's got a few stuff, but you can see this is all JSON, this is all code. So instead of me looking through this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to Visual Studio because this isn't very helpful to me. Um, I'm not really going to look at the folder itself. I want to look at the Visual Studio code. So this is Visual Studio code not the full Visual Studio. I'm going to go through this really quickly. I, I'm, it's more a demo just to show you the, the examples. It's not particularly um, a demo to, to really tell you how. But what we've done so far is this. Um, right, so I'm skipped ahead there. What I'm going to do is from my Visual Studio code, this is it, opened blank. I'm going to say File, and I'm going to say Open my folder. I'm going to open the folder that I saved my Git demo in. 
So like, what's cool is you can open a whole folder in Visual Studio Code. So here we can see I've opened the folder, get demo, and I can see all the stuff inside it. So if I open my data set, I can see, for example, a model.bim. This model.bim is essentially the file that you edit when you're editing tabular editor. This holds all the code behind the data model. What I will say about Power BI developer mode, this is nonsense to read. <laughs> They're working on better ways to do this. I think they'll split these into smaller files, as you see, it makes it much easier. Right now, it's not very useful <laughs> to have just one big file. It, by doing this, it enables us to do Git. It will get better, I think, the experience. But I can't really see much. I don't understand this. I can see this is M code, right, and stuff. I also have one in my report. I have the same kind of thing. It's called report.json. And this is just a big bit of code. And you can see this just, it basically says where all my visuals are laid out in pages. Um, no way anyone can understand this, but you don't really have to at this moment. So this is my Git. So I can actually see now the code behind my um, Power BI file. What I can do is I can go to this button here and it's called source control. So this is why I like to use Visual Studio Code because this is all built in. It has Git built in. So I go to source control and I do something called initiate repository. What this does is this basically does this step. So I had my code and this was, you know, a bunch of files. In my example, I just had one, but in, in real life, I had loads of files. So I had my code. When I said initiate repository, it started this. It, it created this little database on my machine. And this is where it's going to save all the versions of code on my local machine. Right, those commits that we do, it saves it into my local, my local database which is that it calls it, when I say initiate Git, initiate the repository, this is it. And what it does is I can say, now I can click commit. These are all the files that's actually I'm committing. So this is all the files and all the folders. You'll see here that, you know, a bunch of these are the images, for example, this is the background images. So I'm saving everything. So inside these folders, it's, it's split everything out. It's also all the different parts of code. And this is the main report one. They have things like, um, you know, metadata. You don't really have to understand what this is. You won't edit most of this. But these are all the versions, all the different bits of code that I had that folder. So I'm going to commit. It's going to do on a stage. When I'm getting staging, it just means I can commit certain parts. Not important. I'm just going to say yes. Oh, and I didn't give it a message. So. You have, to, you have to write, and this is where you write comments, and that's a huge thing of Git, right? So you need to write comments so people know what you're doing. I'm going to write this as initial commit because I've not done anything. I'm just doing the first one. Hey, I've committed it, so I made my first save, right? So in this version, I basically, oops, remember, sorry, I've done this. I initiated the Git. I made this little database, and I had a saved version. You can actually see this as well. So if I go back to this, um, the folder, you can see that it's made a hidden folder called .git, and this is where it saves everything. Uh, question? Yeah, thanks, Steve. I was just thinking about uh, the git ignore file. I see that file there that's .git ignore. Yeah. Um, does that, it looks like that got created automatically, and uh, yes. I was curious if, if what all that does for you. So what the git ignore is, is sometimes you'll have things and files which you don't want to put into version control. So thanks for the question. Um, when you have Power BI, when you when you open a, a Power BI, for example, what it does is it has a copy of the data, right? So obviously when I'm working, right, in order for me to see numbers, I, I see a copy of the data. It downloads a copy of that data and it stores it in something called a cache API. This isn't code. This isn't anything I want to put into um, into my my Git. So you can write, and you, this is just means the folder path. And I can just say anything I include in this list, it will ignore it, and it won't use that for version control. So you don't always want to put everything into version control. You might just have some stuff, for example, the data, because when I'm going to publish this, it's going to publish the data. It's going to refresh in the service anyway. The version of data I'm using is just a local one that that isn't copied up. So it's just a folder uh, file that explains what I don't want to do with Git. Thank you.
Cool. So now I've done this. At the moment, though, right, this is all on my local machine. So I want to obviously do the next step. And that is um, this. That is to have this remote repository. So to do that, I'm going to head over now to uh, Azure DevOps. If you've never seen this before, don't worry. This is Azure DevOps. Welcome. I'm gonna, I have different projects. I've made this new project called Git User Group. You'll see something over here called, you might hopefully familiar with some of these, these names, right? Um, Azure DevOps has a whole bunch of other stuff, but what we're interested in repos. So this is repos. This is their central version. I'm going to click repos and I can see the files. I just created this moments ago. So right now it's empty. I've not synced it up anything. This is brand new. I created this about five minutes before this user group. What I'm going to do, and I won't worry about this because you can see um, step by step instructions and demos on how to do this. But this is the, the URL to my to this DevOps instance. So what I want to do is I'm going to go back um, to my I copy this URL. What I want to do now is I say, hey, I'm going to remote and add remote. So I'm going to add remote. I'm going to paste in the URL. And I just need to give it a name. So I'm just call it Azure DevOps. And now it does some stuff. It spins around and it, it thinks about the remote. I can now just call this publish branch. Now I'm going to publish everything I have into the remote. So what this does is it makes this remote repository. Essentially, what I've done now is I'm just setting up the link between my local machine and the version in the um, in the repo in the cloud, right? Because it didn't know which project, it didn't know what I'm doing. That just copied the link and I just said, hey, this is the version of Azure DevOps. So what I've done now is I have that initial commit. I saved everything locally. I clicked this publish branch. And now if I go back, refresh my page, this is Azure DevOps in the cloud version. I publish my changes and I can actually see them here. So they are all here in the version on, on Azure DevOps. So I push my changes from my local machine into Azure DevOps. What's very cool is I go back to my Power BI file. Let me change this file. I'm just going to change maybe the, the title color. I'm going to make a change. So I've just changed this title to blue here. Oops, this title to blue. I'm going to then oops, sorry, save my file and close it. You have to save and close. Now, because I've saved this as a Power BI X file, as soon as I go, uh, sorry, a PBIP file, as soon as I go back to my um, my visual code here, it sees that I've made a change. It's going to watch me in real time. Every time I save and close, it sees I made a change. I can actually click on this and it shows me the change I've made. Now, you'll notice this is not very helpful. <laughs> Um, this is what I mean. They have some work to do to make this file readable. Um, if you change, you'll see somewhere a color, right? The color code, maybe here, of the title. Right now, it's all in one big garbage, so I can't really understand what's changed. When, oops, when they do this and make this more readable, um, you'll be able to see and compare. That's the idea. You're comparing the two code. One on the right is what I've just done. The one on the left is from my last commit, the last save. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit. Remember, this is just changing it now on my local machine. So I'm going to say changed, oops, change title. And I can say I commit this. Yep. So I'm saving it. So I'm doing that local save into that, that Git database. Now it's saying, do you want to sync your changes? So I can sync this and I'll push it back up, right, to the to the main. So now I'm saying I've done my local stuff, push it back up. Again, normally I wouldn't do this. I said we want to do branches because we don't want to edit the main one. So I can actually down here, I can just click, I just clicked on the bottom left and I say create a new branch. I must call this feature branch one and rubbish name. But <laughs> I've created a new branch. Let me just publish this branch. Again, I know I'm going through really quick. So I create a new branch. In my Azure DevOps, this is the cloud version. I can see here that I can see I created, and this is that branch now. 
So what I can do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to make some more edits um, to, the, to the Power BI file. Instead of though just you know committing this to main, I could commit this to that to that branch. This way, this is what we should be doing because we don't want to be working off the main version and committing it accidentally. We want to do everything in a branch where we can collaborate um, because just in case we do something wrong, we have all these build pipelines, all this review process. So let me just make a change. I'm just going to move this this over here. Maybe move this down here. Save. You have to close the file. And then if I go back here, did I open the wrong file? I think I opened the wrong file. <laughs> it's not open the correct file. Anyway, I opened my, I have a couple of copies of this. And you'll see in, in the folder, you have this, in the main folder, you have this um, file, it's just called .pvip. This is how you can just open your report. <laughs> this is the one in which lets you open it because obviously this is all code. So what I'm going to do is, yep, I'm just going to move this over here and move this down here. Save, close. Now you can see the changes I made. This lists all the files because I'm just changing the report. If I remove backgrounds or added pictures, right, I'll have multiple files like we saw at the beginning. I can now um, just say moved. Move, commit this, sync my changes. Now you can see, and you know by the bottom left, right, that I'm working on that branch. So I'm actually syncing this to the branch. And you can see I've updated um, feature branch one just now, and it tells me. Let's say, for example, I'm happy. I can say, OK, I want to merge this branch back into the main version. We've looked. Me and Dave, we've worked on the code, we've done it. Here's that pull request button. So I click on create a pull request, and I can give you descriptions. Typically, you'll, you'll have processes in case you set up um, options. I'm just going to say create, and I'm just going to complete it myself. Um, this would normally go to someone else. What they would do is then they would go and they would look, and they can click here. And then again, they can see the changes that I've made. Um, from my branch into the main branch. So again, this diff compare, right? This way of comparing everything. You can just complete this and I can complete the merge and you can have settings and, and this is where you'd run those build pipelines. Close. And then typically what you do once you've done it is you just delete the, the branch. Um, you just tidies it up because I don't want all these branches where nothing's happening. I do small little changes, make a branch, make the changes, put it back in. So what we did here, that's right, we, we set this up. We created that branch, I called it feature branch or something. I made a couple of changes to it, right? And then I said, do this pull request. Um, normally someone else will review it. I just approved it myself, which you shouldn't be able to do, but there's no one else here. And I put it back um, into the main one. And then the final bit, which is really cool, is that now I can go, um, just go to my correct workspace. Uh, oops, let me create a new workspace for this. <laughs> but it's it, user group. And this has to be a fabric, right? So I'm in the fabric trial. What I can do in a Power BI workspace when it's a fabric one is there's this thing called Git integration. And it says, where do you want to go? I choose my organization. I call this Git user group and Git user group. And it actually says which branch you want to use. Right, I'm going to want to use the main branch, as I said. So this is really cool because now with the other branches, it won't be synced until it's been merged back to the main. So I'm going to connect and sync this. What this does is everything I've been doing, all those changes I've made, everything I do through Git, will automatically sync this from my Azure DevOps. Right, so I'm syncing this to, to this, to this file, these in Azure DevOps. These are all synced together, and I just give it a sec as it as it comes through. And you can see now this is in sync. This is going to be um, synced up together. It takes a few seconds. Um, but this will have both the data set and the report. So yeah, here's the report. And you can see it's the report that I've been changing on my, my desktop, right? And I moved all the stuff. Um, I think there's some areas in this, this but you know, I changed the title. 
So I can go through that process. I don't have to publish it. And I go through all the, the Git stuff. I go through Azure, Azure DevOps. Essentially, Power BI will just pull in all those changes automatically. And that is essentially this, this whole process, right? So I do my Git on my local machine, push it to DevOps. This is automatically synced. Okay. <laughs> so um, in terms of the Git stuff at the beginning, I know I went through it very quickly. Go to this website as well. Um, you'll have a lot of uh, all the Git. I know the uh, Power BI um, developer mode demo was very quick. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. So once you start playing around, you can go through and just Google kind of how to do stuff. I just wanted to give you an overview of what it did and how it worked. With that, <laughs> any questions? Um, I know this was a, a whole lot of information very quick. I wanted to give a, a high level overview of Git. Bye. Everyone. It seems like they got it there. But uh, yeah, the, um, anybody out there using Git for things besides Power BI right now? Doesn't sound like that, that is the case right now. I did want to share one one tool that I found helpful, and I think Visual Studio Code does a nice job of this, but I have mm -hmm. appreciated this tool. It's called Fork or Git Fork, and it uh, it costs about $50 at most, but it's cross-platform and um, does a nice job of like helping you visualize those branches and does a nice diff tool side by side. So again, like Visual Studio Code and other tools have some good, you know, built built-in plugins. Uh, but I, I think this is kind of nice because once once I got I could learn kind of how this visualizes stuff. Um, they made it where I hardly ever have to type any Git commands or anything like that anymore. I just can rely on the UI and it it issues all the commands I'm I'm looking for. Nice. So yeah. I'd recommend that tool. You get a lot of, of people who've been doing Git a while and they love doing things. And, and you, you, you know, I showed you through the UI, but everyone loves doing it by typing things manually. And it's they do. They do. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure it's fast. I can't imagine, to me, I can't imagine that like doing the diff operation is any faster in the terminal. Like that's such a visual thing. It's hard to, yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe they're better at that command line with the reds and the greens everywhere. Yeah. And if you if you want to see a lot of this is just like kind of this is where I started learning it, but it's kind of the oh I don't know the homepage I guess on the internet of the project, the open source project. So a little bit nerdy there for sure. Okay, it's very nerdy, but yeah. Hmm. If we could use it for things like Excel, oh man, would it? You know, it would be amazing, and you probably could to some degree, but you wouldn't get all the same visual but until Excel has a developer mode like like Power BI does. Yeah, not much benefit to it. If you what? do like things as well, um, SharePoint as well, I will just put this down. Um, I think I mentioned this tool at the beginning called Power BI version control. It's opposite of Git, right? So it's it's that centralized instead of this distributed. Um, it's got all the how to. So this is a nice one. If you don't think you're quite there on Git yet, and um, we recommend this as a good stepping stone. It's a power app, really free to download. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Well, Steve, thanks so much for walking us through that. Um, I, I'm going to make sure I get this posted up on YouTube. If that's all right. I'll get, make it where you can reference it and link to it as well. Um, I really liked the simple visual explanation of the of the why branching and merging because that concept sounds pretty tough at first and uh but when you see it with two simple text files like that it makes a lot of a lot more sense um i do think this will be you know it's new this year but in a couple of years i think it'll be pretty standard practice for people working in power bi because we've all I felt so. the pain of yeah. whoops i deleted that page or whatever <laughs> you can't <laughs> or we both changed the same pbix 
And now we just yeah. have to man manually merge our changes, and that is super painful. Yes. Yeah, people have been yeah. asking this since it came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Well, uh, group, we will meet again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Were, were you saying something uh, there, Brandon? You should always make sure you've got something backing up all of your local files. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that that was a lesson one of my juniors had to learn this year because they did have one of those whoops moments with Power BI. Okay. Yes, um, um, SharePoint is great. A minimum, I always say, do SharePoint. Um, it's it's great for that. But yes, uh, I think a lot of people have have learned that very difficult lesson uh, the hard way. This can really, I mean, the, yeah. And what this can really do, Brandon, is just accelerate your team to work concurrently on things, you know, where if, right now you have to be careful to only work in series, like, okay, you've got it, now I've got it. And that just slows the whole process down. Is there any, the one thing I feel like hasn't been covered is, does anyone here have any idea of exactly what the future plans are for version control with Power BI. Can we bring Zoe on and tell us exactly what the <laughs> what they're doing? That would be awesome. Yeah, Steve, you, you you might be aware of this, but before Zoe joined Microsoft, you know Zoe Douglas on the product mm -hmm. team? She was like a co-leader of this group of the, of the oh, Oklahoma nice. group. I know. So we're 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 kind of famous that way. We don't like to brag, but yeah. <laughs> I'd say follow uh, Rui Romano because he this is his project. Um, so he's a really good one to to go and, and follow. Um, yeah, he's, he's got some cool stuff. Matthias is the other one. Um, Dear Back, he does PBI tools. He helps out, out with a lot. So those two, um, they're really, really driving the Git effort, I would say. Say those two are the, the, the people to look out for. Could you um, drop links to uh, to follow them? I was just Brent putting their their Twitter working. profiles in there. Yeah. Yep. And uh it's it says twitter.com, but don't be confused. This is these are this is X. <laughs> X.com. A lot of people haven't heard of Twitter, so you know, just gotta make sure that's clear. Just don't let your parents see you on there. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It's very true. Nice. All right. Well, uh thank you all very much for being here. We will meet again November 16th. I will get the word out sooner this month. It was uh, it was pretty busy this last uh, four weeks, so it kind of got a little last minute, but glad you all got the message and were able to come. And I think we'll talk about PBI tools, assuming my 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 presenter was going to do it this month, and then he was like, wait, I have to set up a whole other environment, so he wasn't quite prepared for that. But I think he'll get enough lead time. He should be able to walk us through that. That's what we'll do. Maybe a great one to follow up on Git. So. Yes, sir. Yep. Thanks for exactly. showing us off. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Yep, next time we'll come to you. All right, thanks. See you guys later.